But if you were to come to a, a, all kidding aside, we're here for a very serious reason. And if you were to come to Georgia, uh, this would be the first slide that I'd show you when uh, you came to a county meeting or I spoke to dealers. And, and basically this, what I would say, summarizes the things that we heard this morning from my colleagues uh, from Arkansas using all these things. There may be a, a, some variations based on some things we're doing in Georgia a little bit differently. Uh, based, we are maybe one or two years ahead of you in our, in our fight against the problem. And you'll see at the very end, I have uh, things such as hand weeding and non-selective applicators. And I'm going to refer to uh, the applicators as non-selective applicators because there's more than just WIC applicators out there. There are other things. Um, but you'll see at the bottom of my list, you know, we want our growers to do everything possible, humanly possible, maybe inhumanly possible, before they get down to those last two uh, options because those are certainly uh, something we're not used to doing. And just to, uh, uh, so why am I, why am I talking about non-selective applicators? Now, te the technology is not new. It's been around for 30 years. We've never really used it that much. But uh, this slide, to me, illustrates the point. This is where we're at in Georgia right now. Ken talked about hand weeding. When we talk about hand weeding in Georgia, we talk about pulling them up, loading them on a tractor, and bringing them to Arkansas. But you can see this is not sustainable. Our growers are spending a lot of money in some, or some cases doing this kind of thing, and it's certainly not sustainable uh, in the long run to have to remove weeds like this in a field. And so our growers are interested in any option possible, including non-selective applicators. So the questions we have to ask ourselves are, are they effective? How much do they cost? And what are the benefits of the non-selective applicators? And I'll try to address that in my presentation over the next few minutes. Uh, before I uh, get into some specifics, you know, I do want to mention that over the last two years, we've been actively uh, doing some research in the area of non-selective use. I felt that the, there was a lot of things going on. We didn't really have any good science behind some of the recommendations that were being made, so that's how I got into it. So uh, we have looked at, at several applicators over the last two years, and I'll try to share with you uh, what we're finding. Of course, everybody hopefully recognizes this. This is what I call the traditional rope wick or the gravity flow. It's probably something that every, every one of you have seen or maybe used sometime or at some point on your farms. Uh, one of the earliest designs can be effective under certain situations, uh, but certainly things have come a long way since then. The other applicator we've looked at is a, is a machine called the Wickmaster Rope Wick. Uh, actually, this was made in Georgia, in Bullock County, Georgia. Uh, all this is is a pressurized rope wick. You can't see it on the slide, uh, but behind uh, the, the uh, apparatus, there's a small electrical pump that would percolate the uh, solution from the bottom to the top to try to keep those wicks uh, more uniformly uh, moist. Um, of course, the one that uh, we've talked about quite a bit uh, to some degree is the Grassworks Weed Wiper. They're here today. Uh, we've probably got the most data on this, uh, this particular implement. And this is a carpet roller. If you're not familiar with it, you can see it uh, up in the front. Uh, basically, this is a carpet type uh, material that, that turns in the opposite direction as you're going with the tractor. Uh, so that's another option for you. We've also looked at another one this fall. Uh, and this is kind of an interesting story. This is the Top Crop Super Sponge Weed Wiper. And uh, that's made by Sm uh, a company out of Oregon. And when you first look at it, I have to admit, when it, when it was shipped to me, it came in a box. And that, that was one of the things they wanted, wanted to do is try to make an implement that was easily shippable. And we pulled it out of the box, we kind of chuckled uh, because it didn't look like it was as stout as we might need it. And in fact, you can look at some Georgia engineering. Uh, that's uh, Gorilla Tape. And uh, we used that just because we, we were only doing one trial and we wanted to get it on and off quickly. But surprisingly, uh, you'll see from their numbers that we've collected, uh, that was a very effective applicator. So don't believe everything you see. And then the last one we looked at recently uh, is, a, is a rig that I'll call the LMC Cross Wick Bar. This was made in Albany, Georgia. And this is actually a pressurized system. Uh, the, the frame that holds the wick is actually sealed and you fill that with air and then there's a way to regulate the air so you can keep those wicks saturated uh, to, the, to uh, where, you, where they need to be. So there's more than just wicks and, and so the, the issue is, are they effective? I'll just show you a couple of quick slides from, 
I'm not going to show a lot of data. I prefer to just tell you what we're seeing. Um, this is from one of our trials this past year, um, comparing the uh, weed wiper to the top crop sponge. Uh, here's our non-treated. Here's the weed wiper. Here's the top crop. And you'll note that the uh, pigweed was 66 inches tall on average at the time of application. And we were using a 50% solution of gramoxone. And that's really what we're focusing on in Georgia right now is a 50% solution of gramoxone antion. And then we were able to get a later trial in this fall, again, comparing the weed wiper to the LMC cross wick bar. Uh, here's our non-treated check. Here's the weed wiper. Here's the, the uh, cross system. Now there, the pigweeds were a little smaller. Uh, they were only 34 inches. Only, I say only. That's still pretty big, 34 inches. Uh, but you can see they were both pretty effective in, in managing those larger populations. It's really interesting what we're seeing. Um, you wouldn't think... You know, we know that gramoxone is not a translocated material generally, uh, but we are seeing movement uh, down into the lower portions of the plant and getting uh, com almost complete control in some cases. Now, just to quickly summarize our data at this point, I think we've got eight or ten field trials right now, um, certainly on a learning curve on how to conduct research with these kind of the, uh, track these kind of implements. You can see they're all custom made pretty much uh, so we could test them. Uh, but just to summarize, uh, if you look down the columns, uh, we've got the most data for the weed wiper. We're averaging over 90% control. The gravity flow rope wick was uh, not effective in that trial. Uh, the wick master was a little less effective. You can see the top crop wiper was right up there, the 99% control. And the uh, LMC cross wick bar was giving us 85% control at roughly 30 days after treatment. Again, that's all with a 50-50 solution of gramoxone intion in water with the exception, exception of uh, trial number four. So there is some potential there. I think you can see from these numbers that there's certainly some potential uh, for them to be utilized. Now we've tried, I've mentioned gramoxone intion. We've tried that and that's what we're focusing on. We have tried other things um, and you'd be surprised at the things that are going on. Uh, we've tried Ignite in some of these systems and we've tried Cobra. And neither one of those, in my opinion, is effective in those applicators that we've, at least at, the point, at this point now. Uh, we may change our mind as we do some more work, but I don't feel comfortable telling anyone that either Ignite or Cobra are effective in a non-selective applicator. Now, I've heard rumors that, that are just rumors of other things being tried, like Velpar, uh, Banville, Remedy, um, the kitchen sink, you, you name it. Uh, people were trying, uh, thinking about trying different things, and I would caution you as a grower that you've got to be careful um, with what you're doing. But uh, at least right now we're seeing that Gramoxo and Intian uh, does have a fit. Now I guess the, the next question would come to your mind if you're a grower sitting in the audience as well, how much does one of these rigs cost? And if my price is wrong for the, wick, the weed wiper, Bobby, I apologize. Uh, you can go talk to Bobby Elmerson in the back, and uh, he can give you a better, maybe he can give you an Arkansas deal, Bobby. What do you think? But anyway, these are generally about the, the prices for the various applicators that you'll see. So, you know, they're not, in, they're not uh, cheap. Um, you do have to pay something for them. But they uh, just kind of one comment I would make that, you know, if you look at this price, that's the lowest price tag, at least right now. But uh, I have some concerns about its ability to withstand uh, some of the larger plants that we sometimes see. Uh, if you're going over several acres, some of you may have seen some plants already that are extremely large. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how much that, that particular implement will, will stand up under those populations. So if we're talking about, you know, we, we have proven, I think, that we can control some larger pigweed with uh, some of these applicators using gramoxone intion at a 50% solution. So what are the benefits to you as a grower? Well, first of all, uh, particularly if you're talking about soybeans, is improved harvest efficiency, or any crop really. If, if you've got some of those larger plants in there, it's certainly gonna make it a little bit easier to get your, your harvest machine through those fields. Uh, if you're spraying fungicides on your soybeans, I, I spend most of my time working on peanuts uh, so uh, not having those weeds there when we're applying fungicides is, is certainly beneficial for improving our fungicide sprays, and it could be if you're spraying for rust. But probably to me the most important thing that we would be doing with these applicators, and I can't remember who mentioned it today, if it was Dr. Oliver or uh, one of the other speakers, but is managing the weed seed. 
You know, one of the things that we're trying to tell our growers in Georgia is that we have to think about the weed seed bank. And um, this is where I think the greatest effect of uh, these applicators comes in. You'll notice I didn't mention yield at all. Because if you have allowed pigweed to get that tall in your crop, you've already hurt your yield. You'll never get it back. So all we're doing at this point is uh, trying to cut down on seed production. Is it cheaper than hand weeding? Uh, we've got some growers that in our state that are spending upwards of $100 an acre to hand weed. That's not sustainable. Uh, from what I've been told uh, from some of the growers that are using these rigs, you know, generally we're using uh, on average roughly a quart of solution per acre, give or take. And so if half of that is Gramoxone and Inteon, that's only $4 in product. Now, of course, you had to pay for the machine to get there. Perhaps some growers could uh, share one if, if costs were, uh, uh, the price of the implements were a major concern. And the last one is revenge. Uh, you could get back at those pigweeds uh, for uh, whatever heartache they've caused you throughout the year. But again, to me, the real benefit of this is starting to think about managing the seed bank and not allowing those plants to go to seed. Now, I mentioned I spend most of my time working on peanuts. I, I do work um, corn and soybeans as well. But ideally, this technology works better in peanuts because the crop only gets uh, 12 to 18 inches tall. And then we can get a good height differential between the crop and uh, the uh, weed. And in fact, we were able to get a, get a registration uh, working with Syngenta. Uh, we got a 24C label in the southeast for the use of Gramoxone and Tiana on peanuts in Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina for the, for the management of Palmer amaranth and also Florida beggarweed. Now the big issue for y'all is, how will these work in soybeans and cotton? My biggest concern is that soybeans and cotton are much taller than peanuts. And so you need a, a, some kind of height differential there uh, to exist to get maximum application to the weed and minimal uh, application to the crop, which brings up crop response. You know, we've got to worry about, I'll talk a few minutes more about dripping and things like that. And then the last thing is, is it legal or not? Right now, I don't know anything that's legal in a non-selective applicator, and Ken and Bob, you may correct me in the, your state, other than glyphosate, uh, there, there are no labels for... Sure. Sure, and I, and I don't, I'll be honest with you, I don't know if we're gonna pursue it in cotton or in soybeans. Um, we've had some people try it. This, is a, this picture that you're seeing is in cotton, and it looks like it was very effective, but all those plants regrew. And I'll try to address that in a minute. Oops, oops. So, if, if, if you're thinking about using non-selective applicators, what are some tips that I could offer you based on some of the things that we've been doing over the last few years? First, I think we've shown that all of the applicators out there that are not equal. Some are more effective than the others. Some are more expensive as well. Uh, so be careful. Well, when, I would encourage you to talk to any growers that may be trying them. Um, talk to the manufacturers that are here and, and others to learn more about those implements. In my opinion, at this point in time, uh, I believe that we need to get at least a 50% wipe on, the, on a plant for a non-selective applicator to be effective. That's based on the numbers that we've collected right now. What does that mean? That means that um, if you've got a 50 inch tall pigweed, that applicator needs to be set at 25 inches or less. And depending on the crop, you may or may not have loose. Am I okay? How much more time I got? I got five minutes? Okay, I'll wrap it up here. Remember, you're driving a tractor, not a starship. Uh, as much as it, we'd all like to be Captain Kirk, the faster you go, the less effective that those applicators will be. In most of our research, we're driving three to four miles an hour, maybe five. I get a little, I get when I'm driving, when I get much faster than five, I start worrying about how straight I'm driving. Y'all are better drivers than me. But slower is better. Probably the most important thing if you're gonna use a wiper is it needs to be put on the plant before seed is formed. And generally that occurs based on some newer data that's come out of Illinois. Hopefully we'll, we'll get some uh, more local data that viable seed can start to be produced in as early as two weeks after pollination. And so we would like to target those applications then. And uh, if you've already got seed there, uh, to me, you're wasting your time. Uh, 
because the, it's likely that the gramoxone uh, won't affect the germination. Here's a good tip uh, based on experience is read the operator manual. There are some good things in there, uh, to get some problems you can potentially avoid. Uh, trust me on that one. Uh, try to do everything you can to minimize dripping and because they will drip, some of them. And then stewardship is extremely important. Uh, we're, hit, we're dealing with a, a concentration that's much higher than you're currently using. If you're using gramoxone in a burn down, uh, prior to planting, you're, you're using two pints the acre in 10 gallons of water or 15, you're, you're talking about a two to 4% solution of gramoxone. Here we're talking about a 50% solution. So we gotta be a little more cautious on how we mix, how we, where we mix, how we transport, all that kind of stuff. Just a quick uh, uh, learning experience for you. Because we didn't have anything labeled, I haven't done anything on a larger scale in growers fields. But once we got the label on peanuts, I decided to take my rig out to, the, to a growers field locally to see how it would work. And of course, whenever you do that, you run into some problems. Uh, but the good news is most of these problems have been fixed by the manufacturer, except for number six. I, that's genetics, I can't do much about that. But anyway, all those other problems are, are fixable. And, but the point I wanna make is, is that if you're using one of these materials, one of these applicators, they're likely going to leak. You need to, you need to work with the machine. It's part art, part science, and it just takes a little experience getting used to um, how you set up the machine and how they work. So with that, I'm going to close in this, this slide again and remind you that before you think about the use of a non-selective applicator, we've got several other potential control, control strategies that you may want to consider implementing before you get to that point, but certainly uh, non-selective applicators uh, could play a role in certain situations.